Acts 13. And, and really, the, kind of the emphasis of this particular weekend is to understand a little bit more about the transition nature of the book of Acts, something that Alex mentioned, mentioned last time, and I'll just kind of uh, briefly mention it again. Look over, look over to Romans 11. You see how in Romans 11, let's see, where am I looking at? Look at verse 12. Romans 11, 12 says this. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the what? What's the next word there? Now, think about that word diminishing. What does that word diminishing imply and really demand? Gradual. Exactly right, Bill. Okay, so you think about that. It means even though God brought in a dispensational change in a moment of time with the salvation and commissioning of Saul, who became Paul. Remember, he says that in me first. Even though from heaven... It was a moment of time when things changed. There was a gradual unfolding of the information. And hence, the diminishing. Israel became less and less and less and less of an issue from Acts 9 going forward to Acts 28. And the dispensation of grace and the information that Christ was making known to Paul became more and more and more the issue. So... So when we say there is a transition period, that's what we mean by a transition period. There were some things that the Apostle Paul did in the early part of his ministry that he did not do later in his ministry, such as water baptism. Another one such as the sign gifts, things like that. Um, so when you read the book of Acts, you have to remember that, that things are changing from God's perspective, what he, the information he gives, and therefore from the standpoint when Paul is... is uh, learning the information, and then preaching it to others. Now, what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you look at Romans 11 here, and we're going to start at verse 11. We've seen this passage several times already through the weekend. He says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, as we continue our, our theme this, this morning, looking at the transition of the book of Acts and Paul's ministry, we do pray that uh, we'd have win insight, the wisdom here, that we would just believe what it says and that we would allow your word to piece together the details that are given here. Well, thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so as has been mentioned, you can outline the book of Acts by that verse right there. Israel, they, they stumble, but they don't fall at the cross. They stumble later and do fall. Acts 7, and then through their fall, what's that verse say God does? Or what, what's that verse say happens? Salvation is sent to the Gentiles. Now, in this same chapter, I want you to notice something else. Look at chapter number 11. I'm going to go to verse 7. I want you to notice a word here. He says, what then? Israel, so that's the nation as a whole, all right? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. Okay, what was Israel seeking for? The kingdom, righteousness, but they were seeking it by works, which is why they didn't get it, by the way. Okay, So he says, what then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it. Who's the election? That's the little flock. That's the remnant. That little flock, that remnant here, that's that group of believers in early Acts. Peter, the, Peter and the eleven, and Paul was in that group, right? Oh, thank you, David. Okay, who says yes? Okay, no, no. Paul was not in that group. We just heard that Paul was not one of the 12. He was not in the little flock, not part of that group. He was the blasphemer. He was the one that was opposing that little flock, remember? Okay, so Paul was not in that group. So when that verse says that, that Israel has not obtained, Israel didn't get righteousness, but the election got it. And then it says this, and the rest were what? What's the word there? The rest were blind. Keep that word in mind. He's going to use it again. He's going to use that concept again. This time, go to verse 25. He says, For I would not, brethren, I'm at Romans 11, 25. He says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that what? There's, there's the word again. Blindness in part is happened to Israel. Why does he say blinded in part? Was, was the whole nation blinded? Was every single Jew blinded? No, why not? Who was not blinded? The little flock. See that? But all the rest were. 
Okay? It says blindness in part has happened to Israel. Is it blindness forever? What's it say in the verse? No, so it's blindness in part until. So it's not, they're not going to be blinded forever. So therefore, look at what he, he says uh, again, verse 25. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. See how something's changed? Israel, now the Gentiles. But then Israel's not blinded forever. They're only blinded until God's operation among the Gentiles is done and then back to Israel. So relative to our, our theme this weekend and the message now and so forth, we, we have a new apostle, we're going to have a new message, and we have a new people. It's going from Israel to the Gentiles. The prophecy program to the mystery program. You see that? This program to this program. And you got to, for those of you who are relatively new to the chart, you've got to remember that prior to the time that the mystery information was revealed to the Apostle Paul, that's all the information that they had. That, that, that's a complete continuous program. Acts chapter number 2, Pentecost was the, the nat natural, the next natural development from the program that was in place. But when Israel commits the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, that's when God unfolds, he opens the board, if we can say it that way. <laughs> he <laughs> unfolds, he saves Saul of Tarsus, and then over an extended period of time, over about a 30-year period of time, he unfolds, he discloses information to the Apostle Paul, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little more at a time, okay? Paul says, we know in part, therefore we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, meaning the rest of the information, then that which is in part shall be done away. So let me ask it this way. Since Paul does not receive all of the information all in one setting, he only reads, re gets part, part of the information a little at a time, what would, what would you expect to see Paul doing as he goes out and discloses this information? What would you expect him to do? What's that? Okay, so his, his activities in relationship to that information would change over time, right? So therefore, since Paul only has a part of the information in the early part of his ministry, he would likely function under some information that had already been in place from the former dispensation, because that's all he would know. Hence, like water baptism, for example. Okay? That kind of a concept there. All right? Now, so when you, when you think about this passage here in Romans 11, you've got the little flock, they get righteousness. The rest of the nation is what? Blinded. Are they blinded forever? No, they're blinded just for a season. Okay, now, this time I want you to go to the book of Acts now. You can let go of Romans 11 there. This time you're going to go to the book of Acts. You're going to go to Acts chapter 13. In the book of Acts, if you were to chart out the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, Paul, uh, Luke records uh, what we refer to as Paul, Paul taking three, they call them missionary journeys. You ever heard people talk about the three missionary journeys? Don't call them missionary journeys. They're not missionary journeys. Paul was never sent out as a missionary. Paul was an apostle. And when you say that the, the journeys of the apostle Paul are missionary journeys, you're again belittling the significance of his unique apostleship. You're just making these just out as a missionary kind of a thing. All right? These are not missionary journeys. They are apostolic. He's sent out as an apostle as a unique apostle, separate and distinct from those that were apostles before him. So when you look at the journeys of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, beginning in Acts 13, they are apostolic journeys, and he takes three of those journeys. The first one, if you want to write this down, the first one is in Acts 13 and 14, and that's where we're going to spend most of our time here in the next half an hour, okay? Acts 13 and 14, that's Paul's first apostolic journey. In Acts 15, that is one of his five return trips back to Jerusalem after his conversion. Did I lose you on that one? Let me say it again, okay? Let me say it a different way. After Paul gets saved, by the way, where in the book of Acts is it recorded for the first time in the book of Acts of Saul's conversion? What chapter in Acts? Acts chapter number 9. Okay, so after Saul's conversion, 
The book of Acts records him returning to Jerusalem on five different occasions. Count it with me. Ready? Say it loud. One, two, three, four, five. Just make sure you got it. How many times? After his conversion, so Acts 9, after Acts 9, he returns to Jerusalem on five different occasions, as recorded by Luke in the book of Acts. Okay? Acts 15 is obviously one of those five. It's actually the third of those five. Okay? Okay, so then, after Acts 15, what chapter comes next? Thank you. Thank you. Got that okay? So beginning right at the end of chapter 15, or you could say 16, verse 1, all the way over to Acts 18, 22, is Paul's second apostolic journey. It's, it, again, it's, it's, it's the last verse of chapter 15, but you could start at chapter 16. And you go all the way over to chapter 18, uh, 18 and 22. If, if you look there, go quickly turn to 1822. You'll see it. 1822. This is the 1822. This concludes his second apostolic journey. 1822, it says this. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, that's the church at Jerusalem. It says he went down to Antioch. Now that's the church at Antioch, okay? So that concludes his second apostolic journey. And then right away at verse 23, and after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all. This begins his third apostolic journey. So Acts 18.23, and then this time go all the way over to chapter number 21. Look down at chapter number 21, uh, and, and look at verse 16. Look at 21.16. It says, there went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Menaeus of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, that is when he comes back to Jerusalem the fifth time. And that concludes his third apostolic journey. Okay, so what I want you to see at this point, you, you know, hopefully you wrote that down. But what I want you to see in the book of Acts, therefore, beginning at Acts 13, God, the Holy Spirit, through the pen of Luke, records these three apostolic journeys. That means they're all significant, the fact that he took the time to write this down, right? And by the way, when he winds up back at, in Jerusalem for the, the last time there, from that point forward, throughout the rest of the book of Acts, he pretty much is a prisoner. He does some traveling, but in bonds. On, one time on a ship, and then crashes, you know, wrecks in the ocean and so forth. And then by the time you get to Acts 28, he's now in bonds at Rome, and then and then he gets out for a couple of years, and he's back at Rome in the next year, and so forth. All right, so, again, keep in mind that from, Acts, when, from the time that Paul gets saved in Acts 9, all the way to Acts 28, that he's getting a little bit of information at different settings from the Lord. One of which, he actually was caught up in the paradise. You remember that? Okay. All right, now what I want you to do is this. Go with me, if you would, to Acts 13. On Paul's very first apostolic journey, he does something here that, that really pictures the change in the program. It pictures the fall of Israel, the blindness of Israel, and salvation being sent to the Gentiles. It pictures that. In, in this event that happens here. That's why we're going to take the time to look at this, because again, the, the, the book of Acts, the transition period, we're going to see the change in what he does here. All right? So look with me at chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets, prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said... Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto, whereunto I have called them. Now, jump ahead, hold that verse there, but jump ahead to chapter 14. Chapter 14, where, where, is, where are they in chapter 13, verse 1? They're in Antioch. Everybody saw that? 13, 1, they're at Antioch. 
So he says, separate me. So they begin their journey. Now come back to chapter, or go to chapter 14. And this time go to verse 26. It says, and thence sailed to where? Okay, they're back at Antioch now. See that there? It says, and then sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God. Uh, let me read that right, okay. Been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they what? Okay, so what does that tell us about whatever happens in chapter 13 or 14? Did it get fulfilled? Yes, okay. So there's something very significant here about this particular apostolic journey. The others as well, but this is the, this is the first of the three. And so the Holy Ghost says, separate me, these guys, for the work which I have called them to do. So let's go and see what happens. All right, let's, let's go on the journey with these guys. Okay, look down at verse, go to chapter 13, verse 4. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed into Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Remember, remember where Cyprus is? That's that little island and so forth out there. Okay, watch what happens. And when they were at Salamis... All these Cypresses and Salamis and Seleucius and sailed. That's, a, that's tough. What do, you, what do you call those in, is that alliteration? Whatever it is. Anyway, so <laughs> anyway, it says at verse 5 now. So they're on Cyprus, and it says, And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind. That trigger word, trigger word, not seeing the sun for a season. Up, oh, trigger phrase. Everybody catching my drift here, right? <laughs> okay. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Look at the next verse. Then the deputy... When he saw what was done, believed, what's the rest of that verse say? Being astonished at the what of the Lord. Listen, in this sign here, in this pronouncement by Paul about the condition of this Jew, that gave information that was the doctrine of the Lord. This whole event right here, pictures, Israel's condition now, their fall, their blindness, and salvation going to the Gentiles. Do you see that there? Let's look at this in more detail. This is pretty, pretty amazing, all right? First of all, go back with me, if you would, then to, uh, to verse 6. It says, and when they had gone through the island to Paphos, there was a certain sorcerer false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Any problems with this guy? <laughs> Let, let's, let's look at that verse. Let's go backwards in the verse. Do you know what the name Bar-Jesus? Well, first of all, what does Jesus mean? What does the name Jesus mean? But no, it means Jehovah Savior. Whenever you see the, the three letters in front of a name, B-A-R, that means son of. Um, can you think of other words with bar in front of it? Barnabas, the son of consolation, okay? Things like that. Anytime you see the word B-A-R in front of a name, it's son of, so forth. This guy's got a wonderful name. His name is Bar-Jesus, son of Jehovah Savior. This, this, this guy probably had good pedigree, good, good parents. And these guys probably had, this guy had parents probably... Name them that thing on purpose, that name on purpose and everything. The, the, the son of Jehovah Savior. Hmm, I wonder who that might depict. How about maybe a picture of the Messiah? See that there? So he's got a wonderful name. And after all, when you think, and this guy's a Jew, 
Who were the Jews? Didn't Moses go tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son. I'm going to call my son out of Egypt. Israel is my son. Let my son go. So here you've got a Jew, the right nation, God's nation, with the right name, with probably the right pedigree, probably the right intention by his parents. But we find that this guy has become a what? He's a false prophet. He's a sorcerer. See, what's, if he's a false prophet, a sorcerer, what's that tell us about this guy? What's that? He's, he's what? Yes. Yes. He, he's going to the wrong source for speaking the word of God. He's a false prophet. A prophet is to speak the word of God. Yea, hath God, or, thus, thus saith the word of the Lord, right? A prophet says, thus saith the Lord. But he's a false prophet. He's a sorcerer. He's going to the wrong source but claiming he's speaking for God. He's a sorcerer. See that? Th this guy, in every way, is a picture of the apostate, unbelieving nation. A picture of the unbelieving nation right there in early Acts who committed the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Look at it this way. Back here during the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ gave the nation of Israel and, their, and her leaders every opportunity to believe, did he not? He even told them, he said, listen, you can blaspheme against the Son of Man and it will be forgiven you because I, like Isaiah 53 says, I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to make intercession for the uh, transgressors. I'm going to pray for my nation. And he did, did he not? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Remember that? But he says, you know what? You blaspheme that Holy Spirit, and it will not be forgiven you in this world or that world to come, that kingdom out there. See that? He prophesied. He said, listen, that I came to clean up the house. I came to bind the strong man and, and, and cast him out, and I cleaned up the house. And that unclean spirit that was cast out of the house went to look for some new housing and so forth and couldn't find any. So he comes back to the house and he finds it clean and swept and garnished, but what? Unoccupied, empty. And so he goes and he takes seven more wicked than himself and re-enters the house. And Jesus Christ says, so shall it be unto that generation. The last date is worse than their first. The spiritual condition of the nation of Israel heading into that time when they were going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit and heading into that tribulation period, the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel is going to be seven times worse than it even was during the earthly ministry of Christ that culminated in them crucifying their own Messiah. That's how bad it was. That's that guy right here. He's a sorcerer. He's a false prophet, but he's even worse than that. Look, can it get any worse? Look at what else we're told about this guy. Look at verse uh, 8. Look at verse 8. What are we told about this guy in verse 8? It says, uh, but Elimus, for the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation. Think about that word sorcerer. In the Bible, is that ever a good thing or is it always a bad thing? It's always. What, think about the word sorcerer. What, what's, what do you see in the word? Source. He's going to the wrong resource, the wrong source of his information. They're, therefore, the wrong resource for his life, his activity, his prophecies, his predictions. Who is it that when Israel commits that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, what's their condition? It's seven times worse than it was out there. That's who this guy is. Okay? Now, watch what happens. Uh, look, at, look at the other players here. This time, go to verse 7. Um, it says, 
It, let me go back to verse 6. It says, And when they had gone through the isle into Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus. Now, who is this guy? What are you told about him so far? He's a deputy, so what's that mean? He's got authority. Okay, he's a man of some authority in the city and in, in the island and so forth. What do you know? Is he a Jew or a Gentile, and how can you tell? He's a Gentile. How can you tell? By his, it's interesting. The, the repeated reference to names here. You've got Bar-Jesus, Elimus, bad guy. You've got Sergius Paulus, Gentile, caught in the middle. You've got Saul, who's also called Paul. You see how the Holy Spirit, through the pen of Luke, is talking about the significance of these people, but they have names, and their names are conveying doctrine. Their names are conveying information. Here you've got this guy who is a, obviously he's a, 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 a city official of some kind. He's a deputy. He's an important person, probably an intelligent person and so forth. And his name is Sergius Paulus. He's a leader. And it says this about him. He's a prudent man. What's that mean? What's that mean, a prudent man? Uh, what's that? Yeah, like, like wise. Uh, uh, think about how the Apostle Paul uses the word in, in Ephesians chapter number 1. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1 real quick, how he uses the word in, re in reference to God. Look at, look, at, look at Ephesians 1, 8, in reference to God. It says, wherein he, that's God, hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and what? Interesting, think about that, prudence. But what, what's prudence? What, what is the difference between knowledge and wisdom and prudence? What, what is knowledge? It's just information, okay, information that you can know. So what's wisdom? It's how to use the wisdom. It's, on, it's, it's, it's how to use the knowledge. So you, so you have the knowledge, but you know how to use it. Well, then what's prudence? Yeah. Think about the mystery. Because that verse in Ephesians 1, it says that God has abounded to us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery. Did God have knowledge? Did God have wisdom? So what was his prudence? He had all this information in mind. He, know how, he knew how to use it. But he used it right at the right time. The issue of prudence is the right time to use the information. Right? You're driving down the street. And you see a cop on the side of the road. You got wisdom. You had knowledge. You got wisdom. And now you got some prudence. Let off the gas a little bit there, right? <laughs> right? right? You got that, David, right? When you drive to California back and forth. Anyway, okay, just check in there. <laughs> prudence is the idea that you're not just intelligent, and you're not this you know, big, fat, intellectual, big, puffy, prideful head, but prudence is the idea that you think, you think information through, and you realize information has consequences. So it... It's the wisdom and the, and the proper timing of that, that information. Okay, anyway, back, back to Sergius Paulus. This guy obviously is, is, is a, he's a thinking guy. He knows things has, information has consequences, all right? So it says this, at, at 13.7, it says, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. That's amazing. What else then do you know about this man? Think about the picture here. Did he know Paul and Barnabas from anybody else necessarily? He never met these guys before until they came to his island. Think about that. Who is Bar Jesus calling for? He's a sorcerer. He's getting information from somewhere. Right? That's Bar Jesus. This guy. Sergius Paulus is also calling for someone to give him information. Who's he calling for? Barnabas. He's going to the right source. See how everything is in contrast here, comparison here? This guy has the discernment to know that what Barnabas and Saul are preaching is something vastly different than what he was hearing from Bar-Jesus. Our Jesus was the Jew, son of Jehovah's Savior. The one, remember when God raised up Israel back here and so forth, 
He was going to use Israel to get God's information to the Gentiles. Bar-Jesus should have been the right person for him to call. Everybody follow what I'm saying there? Bar-Jesus should have gone to the right source, God's word. Sergius Paulus should have gone to the right source, uh, uh, Bar-Jesus, to hear God's word. But that's not what's happening. So this man, Sergius Paulus, he calls for Paul and Barnabas to hear the word of God. Let me ask it this way. Let me try to use an illustration because maybe I'm not connecting here. But it's this way. If you want to hear the word of God, where are you going to go? Are you going to go to, quote, unquote, the church of your choice? You know why? Because you'll make the wrong choice. You hear on the radio, they say, you know, the, the, like they're, those that they broadcast Monday through Friday or Saturday, or whatever, and they say, okay, tomorrow is the Lord's day, so go to the church of your choice and honor the Lord. Well, what's the problem with that? It's your choice. What else? Is, it's true. What else is the problem with that? Not every church is preaching the word of God right divided out of the King James Bible. So if you want to hear the word of God, you got to know where the right source is. It, it is not going to help your personal edification. It's not going to help the edification of your family, your children, if you just take them to a local Baptist church or a local, local church out there. It's not going to accomplish what God's Word is designed to accomplish in you. This man heard enough from Paul and Barnabas to say, man, those guys are the ones that are preaching something different than this Bar-Jesus guy. And I, that Bar-Jesus has been my counselor. That Bar-Jesus has been the guy I've been going to and listening to. These guys are preaching something, preaching something different. So he calls for Barnabas and Saul, specifically says, to hear the word of God. You've got two different sources of information. Bar-Jesus was going to his source, and now Sergius Paulus is seeking a source from Paul, Paul and Barnabas. See that there? Keep reading. It says this. <clears throat> at verse 8. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, what does he do now? Withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Okay, what does Elimus do now? What does this bar Jesus do now? He gets, absolutely tries to get in the way. He withstands them, seeking to do what? Is that, what does the verse tell us? So how do you suppose he does, how do you suppose he does that? Well, how does it happen today? <laughs> how does it happen to you today? You try to show someone the grace message, and what happens? They criticize it. They say it's wrong. And who criticizes it? And who says it's wrong? Sometimes they're preachers. Sometimes they're best friends. Sometimes family members, mom, dad. Isn't that something? Well, so here you have this Jew, bar Jesus, sorcerer, wrong resource, he absolutely withstands Paul, seeks to turn this Gentile who's open to hearing the word of God and wanting to hear the word of God, he seeks to turn this guy away from what, God, what Paul is saying. See that there? Now watch what happens. It says at verse 9, Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, now stop there, think about that. What was Israel supposed to be full of? Were they supposed to be full of all subtlety? Who is that? That's Satan. Were they supposed to be full of all mischief? Who's that? That's the adversary. Is that what Israel was supposed to have been filled with? No, what was it supposed to be filled with? Well, back here in Acts chapter number two, what were they filled with? The Holy Spirit. Except who? The unbelieving Jews, like this guy. The, what Paul pronounces on this man here is a, the, the spiritual condition, not just of this one man, but of that blinded nation. He, he's, 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 he's pronouncing the condition of the nation of Israel after they committed the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and they fell. He says here, he, verse uh, 10, and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. Listen, back here, who's, they were the child of God. They, they were God's people, God's nation. Now they become the child of the devil because they committed the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ said, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit and it would not be forgiven you. They had become the child of the devil. 
See that? He says, thou enemy of all righteousness. That was Israel's condition right there at that point. They were the enemy of everything that God was doing. Okay? He says, wilt thou not to cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. There's the dispensational change right there. God's hand was on human history right there. Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun, for a season. Blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become. See what's happening here? Keep reading. He says, And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. See that? The guy's just groping around in the darkness, not, no, no hope of finding the truth because he's going to the wrong resource. Now watch verse 12 here. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. First of all, what was the doctrine that was just put on display in what Paul did in the pronouncements out of Paul's mouth? What was the doctrine? I'm saying, what was the sign? What was, what was the doctrine? Because the verse says, astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. This guy saw with his eyeballs the doctrine of the Lord. What was the doctrine that he just saw? Everybody got that? The blindness upon Israel and salvation to the Gentiles. He just saw that. So when that verse says, this man believed, what did he believe? That's exactly what he believed. He, he believed Paul is now the apostle of the Lord. He believed that the God of heaven and earth is, is, is doing something new on planet earth through Paul's ministry. That all, all before this, Israel has been God's nation. God had his, had his apostles back here. Now Israel has fallen and they're diminishing. And God raised up a new apostle because of blindness on Israel and he's sending salvation to the Gentiles. That's what this man believed. And he's astonished. Why would someone be astonished at that right there? It was a mystery. It was never made known before. Always back here in time past, was there ever Gentile salvation prior to the dispensation of grace? Let me ask the question again. Was there ever Gentile salvation prior to the dispensation of grace? Say, say yes, please say yes. Yes, 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 yes. Was there ever Gentile salvation prior to the dispensation of grace? Give me some examples. Rahab, wonderful example. Give me another one. Well, he was a Syrian, and then, of course, he was Abraham, and then, and then from him come the nation. The Syrophoenician woman. Cornelius. Who else? The centurion. Good. How about, how about Ruth? Book of Ruth. There, there's always been Gentile salvation. People, people will say, oh, the mystery is just Gentile salvation. There was no, that was never a mystery, Gentile salvation. Back there in time past, the way that God was going to reach the Gentiles was through Israel entering into their kingdom. The rise of Israel would see the light that God gave to Israel go to the Gentiles. The doctrine of the Lord through Paul says it ain't happening that way. The doctrine of the Lord, through Paul, says Israel's fallen, and we're sending salvation to the Gentiles. The doctrine of the Lord, through Paul, says Israel is now on the same level as the Gentiles. They're enemies. Remember, Alex just preached that? They're enemies. They're a the child of the devil, like you and I were. Read Ephesians chapter number 2. Without hope and without God in the world. See that? And now, through the message given to the Apostle Paul, God will save anyone who believes this, regardless of Jew or Gentile, bond or free, rich, poor, anything like that. See that? So this guy's believe he sees the doctrine of the Lord. I know we gotta quit. Because I'm hungry. I got you out too. <laughs> but anyway, and I know we're on time schedule down there. I know I know we want to honor their request for us to be there on time. But what we're just trying to demonstrate here is you can see right here, even at Paul's very first apostolic journey, there's clearly there's a change that has happened. That God is getting out to the world through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, as evidenced right here in this in this sign that happened. Okay? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we're thankful that we can take a few minutes to look at this, your word this morning, and to uh, looking forward to lunch right now, having a great time after we've, after we've taken in spiritual nu nutrition for our inner man. We're looking forward to a time now to take in some physical nutrition for our outer man. We thank you for your love and your kindness to us in Christ's name. Amen.
Okay, we probably should head down there pretty quickly, so thank you. <laughs>